How are you doing? Hey, Victor. I'm good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's uh, it's awesome to finally meet you, albeit uh, in uh, the virtual space. But uh, but yeah, man, it's uh, it's great. Yeah, uh, likewise, likewise. Have you been? Um, you have heard from Nathan a lot about the, our little community. I take it. Um, what what do you know, like in general terms, about the Tartarian Empire? Just quickly. Ah, uh, well, I, you know, I don't know. I, I've heard a lot of things. I, it seems like uh, seems like a lot of researchers have varying opinions on it. Uh, the broad strokes that that I've heard about it is physically, you know, it's a, it sounds like it's a place maybe that stretched either over a lot of Asia, maybe Europe, and all that. But it sounds like uh, a lot of people actually use it more of a like a blanket term of something that mm. is like ubiquitous phenomenon. Um, it, maybe that's a, a good way to put it. So I guess I've heard a lot of different things. And I mean, you know, I listen to what I can um, and read what I can on, on people that are in this uh, field of research. But I guess like my own, it's, it's really uh, burgeoning right now. So I guess it's hard for me to really pin down a definition. I guess I could say that I've I've heard quite a bit from a lot of people. I've I've listened to some of the uh, the group chats that you guys have had as well. Um, so I think I've got a a decent idea. Um, am I correct in assuming that uh, a lot of times you would use uh, the term Tartaria as more of a a blanket term of right. Um, phenomena that you, that you would see, whether it be in, in building culture, um, people movements, uh, so on and so forth. Yes, you're, you're exactly right. It has become this overarching blanket term where a lot of us admit that while we call it Tartarian and use this blanket term, um, it's more for a want of, we don't, we, we have a, you know, it's for a want of a a lack of a better term, right? Because we realized that the whole history we've been given had a lot of problems with it. So now we can't say anything about these structures. And then we suddenly realized there's this great empire that has been hidden. And then I, I guess that prompted a lot of people in, in, in the start to say, okay, so this is the, the hidden empire. So, yeah. you know, right, Tartarian, that was how it was born. And uh, we we will see if if that stands ten year ten years in the future. Yeah. But as it is right now, uh, that's how we uh, use the rhetoric. But it's good to to get that on, you know, on clearer terms because uh, I guess a lot of newcomers they when they hear the term and see how it is how it's used, they mm -hmm. they may have a few objections or questions about it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, and I don't know. To me, it it seems like some researchers um, pigeonhole it a little bit more than others do. Uh, so I guess you could get different impressions depending on, you know, what your source is. Uh, mm. But I guess that's like any any field that's uh, new and blossoming. There's um, there's going to be a lot of different opinions. And mm. sounds like there's a lot of very organic, honest opinions out there. Um, and, uh, you know... Actually, it's kind of funny that um, that it is used the way it is, um, Tartaria, as that sort of blanket, because there doesn't seem to be any better name for it. Uh, I think it was just in the last week I was uh, doing a word study for some um, uh, tribal boundaries that that I was I was having to to try to put them into English so that that I could I could do a smoother reading, and the word tar actually comes up a lot. Hmm. It's uh, in, in Obri. It's uh, it's Strong's H eighty three, eighty eight, and eighty nine, and oh. it's used. It's used actually for um, in eighty nine. It would be used for somebody's uh, form or silhouette, like their outline, and it's actually used that same way when describing borders. Um, that that something would be say drawing. I hate to use the word encompassing, but. In, in Obery, if you tend to take a word, a simple two-character, three-character root, 
and double it, <clears throat> a lot of times what it does is it kind of acts as a, an augmentation. And it's, it's very funny that if, if you just put tar and tar together, uh, even though it doesn't appear uh, anywhere in the Bible or anything, uh, or in any extant uh, uh, Paleo-Hebrew, Hebrew that I know of, uh, it would actually mean something that's, that's very akin to like uh, a, a huge place or a broad outline. But, but it could be a little oh. bit even more, um, it could be a little bit more broad than that, just to say something like Tartar. Um, and, and okay. it's very possible that that's where that single occurrence of um, uh, Tartarosis or Tartaru in the New Testament comes from as well, uh, is that same root. And it could have some connections to what was a physical place. Who knows? Wow, that's that's really interesting. Uh, wow, uh, just that that putting tar and tar together from from Obery coincidentally points to a a vast stretch of of space. Just that's just wow, man. But yeah, but yeah let, uh, Jonathan, for the um, for my audience who who aren't aware of uh, or familiar with your work. Um, what what is um, the Obery project that you have been doing for the last yeah li how many years is it now? Uh, it's been probably a couple of years now. Uh, the the impetus of this. So um, I am truly somebody who fell into what I do, uh, completely by accident, kind of stumbled over it on my way to. I was trying to get you know somewhere else and got sidetracked. Mm -hmm. um, I I started out. You could you could probably call me at first uh, really uh, a really a dyed in the wool sort of um, Protestant historicist. So that historicism was the first thing I kind of came on to when you know everything that I was experiencing around me in the world and history and politics and peoples in religion, none of it added up. And, you know, it, it, did, it didn't feel organic at all. And so I started going and looking. And the first thing I found was this idea called historicism. And, it, and it's just, it's one of those eschatological ideas that's kind of, it's not talked about as much as futurism. Futurism is much more sexy. And then, and then preterism is maybe a little more studious. Um, historicism is, is a little bit different th than all of that. And so I got into that. And I, I really thought that was the, the key to a lot of what I hadn't been understanding. And as I started studying uh, eschatology or end times things, um, what happened was, as I got deeper and deeper into it, I found that all of those models, they didn't, they didn't really add up. And mm -hmm. I found that also I wasn't able to uh, get any kind of, of solid direct links between Koine Greek terminology and Hebrew terminology. It just, it wasn't there. I mean... Remind uh, the audience why they would be there or why they should be there. Well, okay, so the idea is that the Old Testament was written in what everybody refers to as Hebrew. It's called Hebrew because uh, a group of rabbis that, that are known as Masoretes Um, they are said to have standardized uh, the text. You know, before that, it, it may not have been called Hebrew because it's, it's literally their punctuation which dictates vowels and their assertion that this language has no vowels, that it's all consonantal, and that their mazora, their dots and dashes, their nakud, Uh, mm -hmm. was a was a standardization of the traditions held of pronunciation. Now, when they did that, they, they are said to have done that in the 7th to 10th century, um, which is really weird because if they did, um, nobody really can explain why none of the texts really agreed until a couple hundred years ago when they had to standardize these standardizations. But you basically have a root language below that. That is the actual character. And more than that, you have a character that is a bit different than that. Not only has there been this punctuation added to the text, 
they's, they've also changed the actual form of the text. In some cases, only slightly. In other cases, very much. Now, we know this because not only are there a lot of artifacts and documents that exist with these older uh, glyph faces uh, on it, but there's, uh, there are stones, there are artifacts, uh, and, and they admit it in their own text. You, you can get uh, the Jewish Encyclopedia or Encyclopedia Judaica, go under language or uh, Mazora Masoret, and they'll show you the progression of what it used to look like and what, what they made it into. Mm. So what, what we have then is we have, we have that. And then we have this idea that nobody can prove that the New Testament was written in this language, Koine Greek, like common Greek. And the problem is that you don't have, you don't have provable equivalence between the two. And when you don't have provable equivalence between the two, and when you have one language that one people, basically these, these Masoretes, um, have just said, well, here's what everything means. Um, we're going to take one word with the same glyphs, and we might parse it out two, three, a dozen different ways. So you have that at the one end. At the other end, you have Greek. Greek has um, so many different forms and types of, of Greek. I mean, you have like, uh, you have classic Greek and, and you have, um, geez, there's the um, Attica Greek and, oh my gosh, I can't even think how many different forms of Greek there are. But, but then you have this, this Koine Greek which is a bit different than, than the others, especially classic Greek. There's, there's really certain differences there. And then what we have to do is believe that, again, um, that the, the New Testament, after the Old Testament, had been written for uh, well over a thousand years, maintaining a linguistic consistency, that they would give this final revelation uh, which was was all pointed to in in the Old Testament. This was like a new covenant thing in Koine Greek, which really doesn't have equivalence. And then you got to take the word of the people who translated all of this. And when you try to put the two together, when you try to compare the one with the other, it doesn't have linguistic equivalence. There, the, you're just kind of left with, I said so. Mm. The the this textual critics they they say so. Uh, the Masoretes, they say so, and so on and so forth. And what happened is I got to a point where I realized that that's where I was. Um, and so when I started looking at, at Hebrew as it, it currently exists and reading the story of the Masoretes and, and, uh, you know, and why it's so complicated for anybody out there who's, who's tried to learn Hebrew, you, you know that the biggest hurdle you have to overcome is learning uh, how to apply their rules, not necessarily uh, learning about the the letters or or more appropriately the glyphs or the characters and how they work together to form a word, uh, the roots of these words, and then how these words work together, the parts of let, let's say a phrase. I hate to say a sentence because there's really no capitals, no periods, no punctuation. Mm -hmm. But instead of instead of learning those things. Um, as, as a form of communication, you're, you're really burdened with having to learn all of these rules and, uh, and, and the whole lexicon of, of the Masoretes instead. So, so the, sy the syntax is, uh, is the hard thing. Well, yeah, yeah. It, it, and you find that even somebody who is not, ha has not invested a lot of time in learning Hebrew as it is uh, modern Hebrew, they'll, they could tell you if they've looked at enough verses, let's say in the Bible, they can tell you that those rules change depending on the situation. So there is, they're, they're constantly, uh, you're, you're stumbling over problems of syntax, uh, problems of grammar. Um, and again, huge problems with, and, and this is the thing that, that really didn't make sense to me that still doesn't to this day. We're looking at a language that even admittedly, and they admit it, they'll tell you that these 
letters, these characters, they are based on images. And these images come with ideas. So you put these same images or ideas together, and they should, in the same way that, let's say, a sentence in English, when you put that together, there are certain parts that work together to, tra- to relay an idea from the, the speaker to the, the hearer. Um, but instead, what you find is where there should be a language where the words being put together should build these certain consistent, coherent ideas, um, that instead, uh, one simple, let's say, three-character word can mean so many things, um, and so many very different things. And, and one of the things about, you know, language, and if it's an intelligent language, and it was designed by an intelligent being, uh, even a perfect being, let's say, um, there shouldn't be those kinds of vast indiscrepancies in that language. Um, so that's, that's what got me to start testing it and seeing if I could find certain consistencies to, uh, the glyphs. So I, I don't even call them letters anymore. They're, they're glyphs or they're characters. You could call them ideographs. And in fact, Dialave calls them signs. Okay. Uh, so, so let's, uh, you name drop the Dialive. You, you and, uh, my good friend Nathan Armaro. Shout out to yeah. him. Yes. You have been uh, doing a um, a series called The Everything Keys, where you go over this obscure guy's books. Um, call he's called D. Olive. Can you um, mm-hmm. can you tell us a bit mm-hmm. about him and why you're looking at his books? All right. Well, <clears throat> let's see. He was he he wasn't actually. He became a linguist. He he lived. Uh, over a century, just a, a little over a century ago. Um, and he was, he was uh, sort of the son of uh, a merchant and, and he became a, a linguist. Uh, he, I think he became very fluent in a, about a half dozen or so languages. And now this is, this is his story. Um, so that, that's, I, I can't speak for the authenticity, but he became very interested in, Uh, applying what he was understanding through the languages that he had learned, some of them being, you know, Chinese, Sanskrit, um, and and then various Western languages, European languages. Um, He became very interested in applying that to Hebrew uh, Hmm. because he believed that it contained that same sort of uh, characteristics Uh, that, say, uh, the Chinese character did and and Sanskrit did, where there was some sort of inherent value uh, to the character itself. Uh, Unfortunately, today, you know, in all of our Western languages, they basically don't have value. If you even ask uh, a linguist in in any Western language, they'll tell you, well, no, the letters don't have any inherent value. Um, And... There's been a lot of people that that don't believe that. I mean, Dialave's one. Uh, you know, there's also the theologian Adam Clark. Um, he didn't buy the idea that that it was you know just a, a phonetic language without value to the character. Uh, another guy, I, I believe his name was John Thompson. He kind of had a movement a couple hundred years ago too uh, that they've sort of buried quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so he um, he wrote this book. Uh, the the Hebraic tongue restored, and in going through it, I, I thought that because uh, you know Nathan and I had had a number of conversations by then about these language issues and how there there really is something to this idea that you really can have a language wherein the the characters and and thus the words and the phrases that they form have an inherent value and, and moreover sort of have, um, because they, they, they have inherent value because they're representing something meaningful, um, mm. that they kind of have this security, uh, to them where you, you really can't toy with them, uh, the way that say the Masoretes lexicon has. Now, Dialave recognizes this. 
And so what he's done is he wrote this book. I think this book is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 800 pages. And a good chunk of that 800 pages, though, is at the end, he, uh, he offers his own translation of the first 10 chapters of Genesis, annotated. And it's heavily annotated. And mm. by the time you get to that, which I know because I skimmed the whole book before I, I suggested that we should just hit that, because not, I don't really agree with a number of his points, but he does hit pretty much every relevant um, facet of this language that anyone desiring to really pick this apart and figure out what's going on can use every single step of the way that that he brings up to to get a, a very good hold on this. Um, you know, now I'm at the point where I'm trying to really establish relationship. Now, the the form I have pretty well, and and as far as they're they're parsing out of a lot of words into various definitions. That's not all that difficult to reconcile either. So at this mm. point, I'm, I'm, I'm more where I want to, to get to understand the form. Um, and Nathan's at a different place in his understanding, too. So the idea was to go through this, this whole thing and to get to those first 10 chapters of Genesis and go over that and compare them. And by the time we're done, what the hope is, is, is that not only will both of us um, have a, a much better understanding than, than where we started out at, but hopefully all the listeners will too. And, and more than that, when, when you consider the, just the sort of, um, broad, uh, range of, of knowledge that Nathan has of a, of a, a lot of things that I don't, um, I had to leave off pretty much every form of research that, I had been looking at a couple of years ago when I started dedicating almost everything to the language and then the, the secondary, which they're kind of, they, they, they're so interwoven is geography mm -hmm. and where did the Bible actually happen? And the, the flora, the fauna, the culture, um, it, it, it's all so interwoven that it, it, it really demands a lot of time. So where I had to leave off looking at, at almost everything else, um, Nathan has an extremely broad, uh, deep knowledge base that very much complements all of the things that, that I really don't know about. Uh, I mean, look what he did with sugar trees. I hadn't even considered the sugar pine, the last Everything Keys uh, show that we did. Yeah, I remember that. Because I, I don't even have time. Um, but, but I can do this. This is, this is really what I can offer, uh, uh, everybody. Um, just looking at these things, reporting what I've found and, and maybe letting those people who, who do have a broader knowledge base, uh, than I do, uh, incorporate this into, into, to whatever they know, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not really trying to force these, these beliefs that I have or theories that I have. And, you know, I am a believer in the veracity of the Bible and I don't really hide that, but anybody can, can take this material, uh, at, for whatever value they want to, um, and, you know, go with it from there. My job is basically to, to report what I find. Um, and, and that's what I try to do to the best of my ability and as honestly as possible. Right. Well, that's um, it's so comprehensive, the work that you're doing. So let's just uh, summarize a bit. You have been searching or researching ovary, Paleo Hebrew, the <clears throat> prototype of Hebrew. Yeah. And, and then you and Nathan have been looking at the Olive, this guy who has also been looking at the old languages for and you've been looking at his books for more clues about it, of course. Mm -hmm. So, so where you, you mentioned, um, geography, which was yeah. something I wanted to, to go into 
about with you because um, what one of the things that I that I really found interesting with your with your research is the land of Amory, um, yeah, which I think was the first thing that Nathan introduced me to because it it tied in with a lot of our research at the time because we were yeah. looking at um, Tartaria being possibly in American antiquity. Yeah. And um, and yeah, when you came with your research saying that Amory, this word, could have mm -hmm. been the real etymology for, yeah, the land of America. That was very interesting because we yeah. were looking at the Moors and uh, all sorts of connections with uh, Amaruka, the land of the plumed serpent. Right. And then you right, came yeah. with um, a much older language, which also made sense and it's still tied in with the the Amorites with which would be perhaps um to my knowledge and what I have gathered so far possibly um the same people that we've been looking at these mm -hmm. black Indians mm -hmm. um which could be part of the ten lost tribes and um what I've been finding Jonathan is that uh, and I I've, I'm sure Nathan has relayed th this to you that in the 1800s, uh, a lot of the um, journalists uh, were were saying and writing about in their articles that it was pretty much the accepted theory that um, that American antiquity was the oldest and the most comprehensive. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. now all those sorts of of ideas are uh, so called or quote unquote debunked or claimed as pseudoscience which I find mm. dubious because it never claimed to be science. Certainly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, how, how can, how can, for instance, like a guy like James Churchward, his, his work is deemed pseudoscience, but how can it be so when James Churchward never claimed his work to be science? Right. Yeah. I, I don't know that he claimed it to be science at all. I mean, he's, you know, he was basing it on, from what I understand, just, uh, you know, artifacts and traditions but I, I don't know how it's what, you know, what part of that is pseudoscience. He doesn't really get into the science end of it. So I kind yeah, of well, understand the, uh, yeah. you know, the trickery in language there. You know, it's right. like claiming that the protocols of Zion are a counterfeit. All right. Well, that's that's a trick of language there. OK, so let's let's get our terms right. But exactly. yeah, what are, what are you saying? Like, yeah, that, that's a good question for mm -hmm. whenever you're criticized. Like, what are you really saying? <laughs> yeah. when they're using such double speak but but yeah, yeah back to um the amory because i have your yeah. little article up here mm -hmm. um and i wanted to read something which i found uh, very interesting um so if you um yeah it m it may take a take a bit because it's a pretty large chunk but but it's very interesting so yeah. you you write here on the second page of your 10 page uh, pdf file about the amory um what about all those Babylonian and, and Assyrian artifacts? What about the Merneptah stele? What about mm. all the artifacts around Palestine and Egypt? I say, what about all the Hebrew, Roman, Egyptian, Phoenician, Greek, and Ptolemaic artifacts, archaeological locations, giant skeletons, sometimes in full armor, earthworks, and still standing ruins in America that are often either covered up declared off-limits, destroyed or lost by the Smithsonian, or attested as fakes by, in my opinion, the most shady of characters. There are two in infractions that will get any case thrown out of court, murder, extortion, or otherwise. One is planting an evidence and the other is destroying evidence. So, interesting, the sorts of people and their affiliations who have hit pay dirt in the Middle East while the FETs and UNESCO are making it a crime to even go near many sites in North America. And what isn't barred from search and discovery via the national parks has often been declared native land or is deemed off-limits by force. I'll readily admit, it certainly seems they're pulling a whole lot of evidence out of the ground over there. But what I can't seem to find in all my extensive searching is scripture to back their stories up. It amazes me how many people would refer to, um, would prefer to accept the evidence of the same sorts of people with the same sorts of connections that brought many of the whites to North America as slaves, 
put half of China on opium, and they're doing the same to white country white countries today. Have been the source of usurious banks the world over, popularized communism, and control most film studios, publishers, and news sources. It is possible that this monolith could craft a story for a multi tired propaganda campaign that might fool the world. Any student of revisionist history knows that is it is not only possible, but it's been done in spades. So I really like that um, paragraph, those two paragraphs actually mm. um, there, where you're throwing into question basically the whole history of, yeah, yeah. yeah. And those, well, that's why I read it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, here's the, 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 the thing is um, about that history. Uh, so that's the other other part that I that sort of got me away from historicism uh, as, as any kind of a model whatsoever is this idea that what's been done right under our noses is a, a cultural historical narrative uh, that that's that's been crafted from just a very small amount of, again, in my opinion, dubious sources, has been married to the information that we find in the Bible. And it's, it's inorganic when you, when you look at it closely and you compare it. Uh, let's say, for instance, the fact that they, uh, they assert that this, uh, this, this patriarch, he was a... Uh, a grandson, or no, he was a grandson of Noah. So we're talking very old patriarchs. His name was uh, Eun. So it would be like a Y U N Eun, or or uh, perhaps Ivan, depending on on where you go and how it may have yeah, changed. And, and I think that would be the Western uh, Javan uh, from the Bible. Right, and they 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 sometimes will uh, translate it Javan, but then they say that that's Greece. And they say that when Iyun, by the way, yeah, Iyun, so Iyun is supposed to, to come over to this land. It's the first, um, widespread empire that doesn't arise in this land where, where all of this is happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, he, he comes over the sea, he covers the land and he, he takes over the empire that, that Paras, which, uh, is often of course, translated as Persia, had once held. And then they say that that is actually Greece and all of these prophecies are about Alexander of Macedon and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the problem is they, they, they have a hard time with reconciling, for one thing, that name with Alexander of Macedonia and this, this empire of Macedonia. Um, and what they've done is just married a few historians' assertions concerning the uh, the campaigns of Alexander of Macedon. And, and why wasn't he never called Alexander the Thracian? See, I don't know. You would probably know more about that than I would. Yeah, it's a question I've been having because Macedonia was not an ex really in existence. Well, arguably, perhaps some people called referred to themselves or were, was referred to as uh, Macedonians, but that whole mm -hmm. area was Frasia. Um, okay. Yeah, but um, maybe there's some. There would be some points there with the timeline because. How far back do we need to go for Frasia to exist? But I have seen Frasia on old maps, um, so so I've been having that question: Why, well, why Alexander of the uh, yeah the Macedon? Yeah, and and I don't I don't want to to rabbit trail too far because you asked me uh, a different question, so I'll try to rein myself back in a little bit. But um, you know, the thing is, I I had just read a, a, a really great book I recommend for everybody. It's a it's a dry technical read, but if you really knuckle down, it's worth it. It's called Facts on the Ground. It's by Nadia Abu Al Hajj. So she's um, she's okay. half she's half European, half Palestinian. She's a professor uh, at a, at the Women's College, um, Bernard, I think it is, of Columbia, New York. 
But she got a lot of flack for that book because what she did was she examined the just the whole, I guess I could say, industry and culture of archaeology over in Palestine or Israelite archaeology. Um, and just the footnotes alone and her uh, her sources are are very <laughs> they're worth the the price of the book alone and, and wow. you can find it you can find it for relatively affordable prices they they did have it like eighty dollars and up for a long time just for the paperback so I mean somebody didn't want a lot of people buying it hmm. but she, she shows you uh, over and over and over again um, these sort of assumptions. In archaeology, the the archaeology over there, and it, it has been promoted more than any sort of archaeology anywhere. That and Egyptology, and then of course there has been for about two hundred years the marrying of Egyptology with the ideas and people and places and descriptions in the Bible, and that's right. the other thing that you know I really try to break it. It's you know, the model is, is kind of like, um, I think Nathan told me that, uh, that you don't buy the globe model of the Earth either, okay? Um, oh, well, I don't. Um, uh, that's not really a topic for uh, discussion. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, let's, let's just say this, all right? For, for any model that somebody questions, if you take any certain model that somebody theorizes, and you present that over and over and over again. So you take the assumptions of wherever, um, you know, people say that, that the tribes were, and, and everybody's got a different opinion on that. On a, pal on a map of Palestine, Transjordan, and let's say Egypt. And that's what you present. You put it in the back of every Bible. Um, it's... Almost anybody, whether whether they they have any knowledge of the Bible or not, has a basic idea that here's where everything happened. We have all of these maps, and you get that model stuck in front of you all the time. Um, one of the things I'm trying to do is just to break the programming of that model. Um, right. That's one of the biggest hindrances we have when looking at any theory is right. that if we've been presented with a model that they say that this is the the correct model um there's no debate um and it's settled that's that's one of the words i i really hate because if there's holes it hasn't been settled but there's a there's a real power in images and there's a there's a big power in putting all of these maps of palestine with say tribal allotments and uh, countries and nations referred to in the Bible, uh, you know, right. overlaid overlaid on the Levant and it, um, stuck in the back of every Bible or the front. I like how you um, how you put it into like a a biblical model, also based on archaeology. For for one of the things that like just to to quickly men touch on, the, you know, the the thing uh, we cannot really talk about. Is uh, that models itself are you know uh, if you're aware of the 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 fallacy of misplaced concreteness or the reification fallacy, it mm -hmm. it, it, it commonly reads as uh, the map is not the terrain. So that's mm -hmm. more the you know empirical stuff. Um, mm -hmm. so, so models in itself are something. Uh, it's a no no word in my book and um, <laughs> especially in empirical stuff with empirical stuff. But um, yeah. but yeah, but the biblical model and the historical model is you know it's it, with her studies of on the ground research and you know comparison comparative um, s systematic methods and such mm -hmm. you, you gain a, a really high level of uh, epistemology and especially when you are only aiming to debunk or affirm like um, a story right so it was easily <clears throat> debunked and. Way. So I, I I find great. I've already um, looked the book up while you were talking and uh, found it, and I'm looking forward to reading that because I, I need to to know that if I am ever going to uh, to argue in debates with Jews over this, which mm -hmm. I am planning to do eventually. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and, yeah. and you know, the, um, the Jews in the field of, of archaeology, um, they're very sharp. Uh, they have, they obviously have a, um, they have a model that, that they certainly have invested a lot of time into. Um, with anybody else, you, you take anything that is an establishment norm that somebody is going to tell you is settled. Uh, most of these uh, claimed sciences and models, uh, they've had a long time to really hone. Whether it's true or not, um, you know, they have had a long time to say, you know, we have all of this evidence and it is, yeah. it is something that if you're not prepared to ask the right questions, um, it, it really does seem like they've got a great model. In the case of uh, the excavations that have occurred uh, in Palestine, we'll just say after the time of Flinders Petrie, who is a whole other story in and of himself, mm -hmm. but from, let's say, after his time, we'll, we'll say from about the 40s, 30s and 40s, from like the time that the uh, the, the Palestinian, uh, it was the, um, oh, what was it? Uh, it? It was a survey uh, that was uh, from, uh, basically, British Jews had, had put together a land survey. They went over, they did these extensive land surveys, they picked certain sites, and, and then they started excavating. And something that she points out is the fact that you know, really, all the great evidence that they say they have, it pretty much comes down to pottery shards, uh, some arrowheads, and some ash layers. And, and most of that is as far as, um, uh, let's say, tying it to something and, and saying that, that this really has to be concrete. This is concretely Israelite pottery from, say, Iron Age 1, so on and so forth. It's all circular. But you're not going to know that unless you have a really good full range of what all is available, um, what are the uh, what are the verified digs that came before that, and something that I, I think is is just as important as anything is those people that made these astounding discoveries. One, one that I would look into, uh, I would suggest anybody look into, is the discovery of the Moabite stone, which is another huge artifact and and read a little bit on the guy who uh went over there and who funded him and that's always a big thing you know who's paying for it and how amazing it is how many people went over there in one trip and found an artifact which has become uh, a real uh i don't mean to be punny but a monolith in M uh, Stille, archaeology right? yeah. Stille. yeah well the guy's the name or the, wait, no, no, it's the stone's name, the Meshastele. Yeah, the the Moabite stone. Yeah, um, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 that's okay. Um, it, this guy, uh, um, he's he's just interesting. You, you can find you can find information on him in um, a, a few different books. There's one book they wrote uh, where him and his party had, had went to uh, the Transjordan. Um, there's also the guy who discovered Mo. Most of what we consider um, artifacts from Nineveh and Assyria and who he was involved with. Uh, one of the things you'll see come up a lot is the Royal Society. And, you know, oh, yeah, the, the Royal you're going to see the Royal London, Society. London, yeah, right? You're going to see them behind almost all Egyptology. Uh, you're going to see them behind almost every discovery that's been made in Mesopotamia. Um and like the guy who uh, who supposedly discovered a lot of these artifacts, let's say in Mesopotamia, uh, this man was a was an Arab. He was uh, he was very intimately linked with people from the uh, the Royal Society and other British uh, aristocracy. And wouldn't you know it? After he made all of these discoveries, uh, he became a, a very um, well. Let's just say he became a British. Uh, politician, very cushy job uh, in, in British politics with, with a, a nice state uh, pay and everything. So, you know, things like that, they, they have to be considered as well. You know, I think we need to always take a, a holistic look at all of these so-called discoveries. Um, right.
and why it is that so many discoveries in the United States have been covered up. Some of them have, have nearly been disappeared. Um, just over a century ago, there were so many small stories uh, that you would find in little local newspapers before they were all right. brought up by the big conglomerates. Right. You'd find these you, stories Jonathan, about farmers. You, you, you may not know this, but I am an avid collector of those old uh, newspaper articles. For what I have found is that there is a lot of references to uh, Tartaria late in the 1800s uh, by it? Americans. Yes, and they talk mm -hmm. about Tartarians um, all, in all sorts of manners. They even mention that the, the there's I found one article and I find all these weird nuggets, right? Where they talk yeah. about the Khan of Tartary being in Reykjavik on Iceland and meeting with Austrian emperors and me, uh, gathering in uh, Syria, the Khan of Tartary and Uh, mm -hmm. The Austrian emperor to 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 have a meeting for the lines of Shem and Japheth to mm -hmm. to discuss uh, and, and they talk about how they are going off of the Newtonian chronology, which mm -hmm. really uh, you know um, I think it erases nearly one thousand years to the Scaligerian chronology, and mm -hmm. it, it, all all these articles are talking about the, the weirdest things. There is even one mentioning that um, in China. It's not mm -hmm. called the Great Wall of China, but the Great Wall of Tartary. Mm -hmm. so, so you're definitely on to, yeah, spot on. All the, the old articles uh, mentioning giants and, as you said, farmers um, finding giant bones. And then he calls... Or just artifacts. Or, or artifacts, they, exactly. They would, yeah. find, they would find all of these artifacts all the time that they could even they, they either identify with some sort of Hebrew-esque uh, characters on them or something... And most of these people, being pretty good natured and wanting to preserve these things, turn them over to either the Smithsonian or or somebody involved in something uh, very similar. Which, which I mean, the, the Smithsonian basically became pretty uh, hegemonic uh, in, in that regard. But this is this is literally what happened to, to who knows how many artifacts in the United States. It was a huge thing in the Midwest. Yeah. I mean, one of the one of the like, uh, the biggest artifacts Mountains, right? that still exists was found in the Midwest. What's that? Uh, like around the Mississippi Mounds, there were like uh, Phoenician tablets and you know so-called Egyptian artifacts and yeah, yeah, the list goes on. Yeah, there's the uh, there's the Burroughs Cave in southern Illinois, um, and there's a lot of controversy around that. And uh, you know, I've I've listened to and read about everything I could find on that. Uh, and it, it certainly does seem to be genuine in the fact that it was quite an extensive find. Um, but there seems to have been uh, agents put onto that immediately and have, have caused a lot of confusion about it. Mm -hmm. um, one guy by the name of Harry Hubbard has a, a, a theory that there, there are so many uh, what are called, you know, Ptolemaic uh, artifacts. Uh, as far as like uh, smooth stones with various engravings on them and things like that, um, and they do, they believe that I believe that that they they have found some remains in there uh, before things were kind of closed down. Now now how they got that place closed off? They said that uh, this guy Burroughs, who was given the rights to the cave, had told a certain university that that they could go in and study. And when they first uh, went in, they deemed that it was unsafe, so it's all been closed off now. But there were supposedly so many Ptolemaic artifacts extracted from this and gold that nobody's seen. There's a lot of accusations about gold being extracted from there and basically sold off uh, under the table. Um, that mm. this guy Hubbard believes that, literally, that the, um, the Ptolemaic dynasty, in fact, He would say Alexander the Great himself. Now, if you can wrap your mind around this, that he sailed from where his empire was supposed to be uh, in the Middle East. He was supposed to have set up in Babylon. But of course, originally he was supposed to be from Macedonia. He sails from there to North America, up the Mississippi, and then travels inland a certain distance to these caves 
and either has his body laid there or establishes a sort of ancestral tomb there, which I can't quite get my mind around. But right. um, the thing is, uh, before I, I forget, the thing with the Amory, that, that whole thing, um, that was just really another accident. It was just <laughs> something that I saw. I had, I'd seen it years ago. Um, that there were these people. So, so the Amorites, they, they come from the sons of Canaan. And Canaan's one of the patriarchs. He's a son of Ham. Um, and he has a, he has a lot of sons. And so they, they basically, yeah. So, so, but, so Ham is the, the norm, the commonly accepted progenitor of the, the dog races. But what well, I that, found is that that's Talmudic. Uh, not, Okay, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry, but but what? Uh, okay, so from what I've gathered, gathered that it is commonly accepted that Ham was the progenitor of the <clears throat> dark races, but I have found someone saying he was the progenitor of the dark races, but not the Negroes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you I, know, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Here's the thing: I have found that 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 theory does originate in the Talmud and some other, uh, um well, let's just say old writings that aren't biblical. Because, see, in the Bible, it's really... The Bible doesn't really mention race. Um, it, it does use descriptions for people. Right. Um, so you, you, you have to look at it and you have to think, well, all right, so, you know, Noah had these three sons. And let's say that we'll just go with... Um, and, and it's not just Talmudic, it's, it's become... I, even a popular Christian belief that they were say different races, but the yeah, that's thing uh, is, okay. So yeah, I, I will, also, I, I work against the, the reification of racism as a concept, mm -hmm. right? Because I, 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 I've, I've also figured out that science cannot support the foundation of races in genetics. So, uh -huh. so I, I, re I really, you know, it's awesome to know that the Bible doesn't use that concept either because that just lends credence when, you know, popular science and uh, the Bible agrees what's not to like, right? So, <laughs> uh, races is bunk. We should not uh, use that word. So what, what I should have said was, uh, yeah, uh, the progenitor of, um, let's say, these, these traits that are commonly accepted as being very concentrated in uh, Africa or Afro-American. That's that's a point of view, um, but I don't I wouldn't know. The thing is, you know, the Bible it is uses a point of view, yeah. yeah, the yeah. Bible uses descriptions. Um, you know, like uh, Esau was was red when he came out; he's very red. Um, and there's descriptions of people as being bright, and there is the the word lebane, which we've talked about, that's used um, sometimes. Bodies like rubies. It doesn't make it easy on somebody trying to figure this out. Anybody who says that it's that it's a very simple thing, it's not so much simple. It, it's no. it's a little tough because it doesn't use words like race. Now there there are there are very specific uh, rules for for instance, once the the nation of Israel becomes a unified nation, there are rules to maintaining it as a people. For instance, if somebody takes a wife or a husband that was not an Israelite, then their children wouldn't be considered as an Israelite until they had married back in, I think it's two times. Right. So there are, there are rules to keep this nation um, consistent. But the, the thing with the, the Noah and the three sons, which I've, I've had a problem with for a long time, the theory of um, one being... Uh, the, I'm just going to use their terms: Negroid, Caucasoid, Mongoloid. Right. Right. Th this is this is a very common thing. The problem I have with that is because they actually stuck together as a group for at least a couple of centuries. Now, Indeed. so they would have been breeding with one another's daughters. It 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 wasn't mm. even regarded wasn't, as a rule um, that you couldn't the line marry of your, Oh well, sorry. Well, later on, like the line of David, um, per, you know, like forbade to to intermingle, right? Yeah, at a at a certain point, like you know, when they became a nation, and just before that, in the time of Abraham, 
um, he, he was taking, like, for instance, a wife from Isaac from his brother's house. So they were uh, staying just, um, by that Just quickly, time. Did, have you heard that Isaac, uh, some say that that is the etymological root for Scythia or Isaka. Is, yeah, I uh, that. Yeah, it, I find this, that very interesting. Like the, they say, you know, f goes to like from Isaac to the Sake to, to the Scyth, Scythia to the Saxon. Because I've indeed. heard a lot of theories on it. And, and there may be a lot to that. Um, I don't know yet. I mean, obviously, there's the, the phonetic similarities. Um, but, you know, the, the thing is, if you have these three brothers, even if they were entirely different races, they did stick together for a heck of a long time until they were broken up, as per the narrative. So they would have to have intermingled so much that by the time they were all split apart, uh, they would essentially have had a, a race that was homogenous. So me personally, I don't buy that because you just couldn't sustain the difference of, of races between the three sons because they were intermarrying for a very mm. long time until they broke apart. Uh, now, I'm, I'm sure that whomever they were, and I know everybody's got a different opinion on who they were, um, whomever they were, they did split apart as per the narrative. The, uh, right. the, the so-called Japhethites, they go a long ways off. They're kind of far. You don't see them again until uh, King Solomon builds a navy. And then the, uh, the, the son of, um, of Japheth, well, the grandson, I'm sorry, the son of Eon, Tarshish. That nation is the nation who runs his navy. Uh, they're obviously extremely adept as naval men, and they are his merchant fleet. So he has a fleet built. These people run his fleet, but but for the most part, they don't interact with the sons of Japheth. It's mostly these these two descendant lines that are interacting quite a lot, which would be Shem and Ham. And That's very interesting because um, um, I, I got the feeling that it was uh, Shem and Japheth that were aligned because uh, Ham had the curse. So he was, uh, you know, Canaan. put as a slave. Yeah, yeah Canaan. It, well, yeah, mm -hmm. but what, wasn't the curse hereditary from Ham's um, uh, transgressions against his drunken father, Noah? Not, not from the Bible. Well, oh, in the Bible, okay. Noah only curses Canaan. It's, it's weird, and I haven't figured it out, but he does. He huh. curses Canaan. So, <clears throat> you know, Ham has um, Ham has four 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 sons. Uh, he has Cush, he has Put, he has Mitzrim, and he has Canaan. And Canaan is his fourth. And there there's some incident that happens. Now the Talmud turns it into something sexual. I don't know that that's what happened. It it, it it's not descript enough. That, that I can make out. But what happens is there's a curse on Canaan. And the curse on Canaan is that his descendants would essentially end up being the servants of both Japhethites, which would uh, in increase greatly in number. They would be like this huge multitude of peoples. Yeah, and yeah. But, so like, uh, so Japheth increases the the tents of Shem, or is it um, the other way around? It's, that's one, yeah, that's one of the the... The sort of, I, I guess, if it was a blessing that he would, it says he'll dwell, uh, Yishab, he'll dwell in the uh, the tents, the Al, the tents of Shem. So, I don't know exactly what that means, but but mm. that's yeah, that's part of it. Um, so yeah, you you you've got uh, Japhethites kind of leaving the story, uh, really not long after the. Uh, uh, the this flood, which doesn't appear to be worldwide, it, it appears to be local. Um, and then oh, you've got the very rest interesting of the story. You would say that, yeah. Why well, can you can can you say why why uh, from the biblical point of view why does it only appear to be local? All right. Well, there's a few reasons. One of it is is, is the the language used. All right. Now the language concerning, let's say, rounding up all the animals. Uh, the word that's used is cull. Call is extremely subjective. Um, it, it's kind of like if you said everything, 
Well, mm. what's everything? You know, is everything everything? And if everything is everything, then you're talking about absolutely everything. Um, you have to understand that every time you see this word, it's speaking of a very limited amount of whatever it is it's talking about. So if it's talking about everything of the land and anybody can go in, they can, they can do cross-reference searches on the word most commonly used for land, this arts, which is probably the root for our word earth. But when arts is used, it's mostly always talking about the specific land mass where these events are taking place at. Mm -hmm. So, so anyways, you have all of these, uh, these animals being gathered up the coal of a certain animal from a certain place. One thing that's very obvious is that there are ecosystems. There are separate ecosystems to different places. Um, and certain animals, we've experienced this in the United States, certain animals really, really upset certain ecosystems. That's why they're all divided like they are. Um, just from a natural standpoint, it doesn't appear to make a lot of sense that all these animals from all these various ecosystems would be gathered up, you know, for this, this worldwide flood. There's other problems, of course, with, with rain. If you had it raining for 40 days and 40 nights, it would boil everything. Um, logistically, there is a mm. guy, I want to remember his name, but I can't because everything he's had has been scrubbed. He, uh, he went through all of the different species of animals. And, you know, you, you really can't use theories like Kent Hovind's because wolves didn't come from Labradors. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, they didn't. Um, there are very special qualities that various breeds of types of animals have. For and a when guy you... who is so, such a good guy on taxonomy, I never got why he couldn't understand that one. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's because he very much wants that model to work. I, I think he's subscribed to it. And that's the hard thing with when you subscribe to something and you, you commit to it, you really want it to work. Yeah. And right. unfortunately, I, I, yeah. And I think a lot of people do that. And it's it's something that I've tried to avoid as much as possible, even being a very open believer in the claims that the Bible makes. If I find something that doesn't work, or if, you know, my theory I have just can't make sense, I'm going to have to drop it. In fact, I'll be the first to, to destroy it if I can. Mm -hmm. um, so when you put all of those factors together, it's just kind of nuts to think that it was worldwide. I just, it just doesn't work. Well, and in, in that area of journalism in the 1800s, there were a lot of people agreeing with that. <clears throat> There was another story from a, a Hindu priest. He said mm -hmm. that that basically that the story of Noah, as we were, you know, told as a, a worldwide thing and the flood, was basically a a you know overdone fiction based on what really happened. He said that uh, I think he he mentioned eight thousand years ago, like in the middle of the heartland of Asia. Well, he preferred Tashi. There was the original tribe of white men. So, and then a little further down, they became civilized. And when that happened, there was a great mm -hmm. upheaval which affected Central Asia, the Middle East, and mm -hmm. America, it would seem. So mm -hmm. I, I think this is what caused the Bering Strait, this upheaval mm -hmm. of the earth. And he, he mm -hmm. both called it a sinking and an upheaval. And it mm -hmm. created deserts, and it created uh, great um, oceans and lakes mm -hmm. in the, the heartland or the homeland, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And he said then that this dispersed the tribe and made them split into two. One faction went to Europe, and another went to the Far East. And mm -hmm. he said that the Far Eastern faction progressed faster than the European counterpart, and uh, that these two parts are... Uh, you know, the origins of modern civilization. 
and he basically tied that whole deal into Tartary. And he mm -hmm. said that there was a great guy um, amongst the Hindus of, this, of those two factions, and he called himself Menon. And basically, mm -hmm. Menon was the prototype. He was the real person which became Minos and Moses and uh, basis for Egyptian mythology, because mm. he said that mm -hmm. these two people came, mm. Chaldea and Egypt and Persia mm -hmm. and all the rest. So, mm -hmm. so I found that very interesting that this Hindu priest is saying, no, 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 you don't know about history. Let me tell you what I know. And then he basically drops this mm. and, and it's in an article, right? In those in right. That era. So, you know, the establishment's narrative that, th that it was a worldwide flood, that it's just accepted. Obviously, there are a lot of people that reject that. Um, it, it's not settled. It's again, one of those things. No, it's not settled. And, and I know that uh, a lot of people think it's it's just a theological matter. Um, and I don't really think that's the case. We should be able to experience, um, you know, if the Bible is a true report and everything that it claims is correct, we should be able to experience these things um, in in the physical world around us, scientifically, rationally, um, you know, barring miracles, and and that's a whole different you know way of. Uh, of looking at things in a different kind of study again when things break the natural cycle but we should be able to 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 see these things as as a rational belief system and and the worldwide flood just on its surface is very difficult to believe concerning the effects that it would have on the land the fact that you can't have it rain for 40 days and 40 nights without killing everything from the heat um, and then you have, for instance, the Bible's narrative speaks against it, too, because you have in Genesis chapter four, you have a, a whole line of the the sons, uh, the descendants that were born of Cain from the Cain and Abel story. Mm. Now, when you, you get down to about eight or ten descendants, you have a descendant called Tubal Cain. Tubal Cain has two sons. One's called Jabel. One's called Jubal. Jabel is, they say, and these are terrible translations, by the way. And, so I'm going to kind and, of... And put, also, um, the city of Tobolsk is uh, is taken from Tubal Cain. And Tubal Cain is also a, a very commonly uh, referred to so-called titan or god in the lore mm -hmm. of Freemasonry. They, they have this, now there, uh, two balls and a cane, which they refer mm -hmm. to Tubal Cain with. There is so, a, yeah, and actually... Uh, there's another descendant of Japheth I wanted to throw in there whose name is Tubal too. So, yes, Tubal, yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah, and, but yeah. the thing about Cain, and this is what's interesting, there's just two things, and, and it speaks against the, the ubiquitous sort of worldwide flood theory. One is the fact that those two sons of his, Jabel and Jubal, they're both named as the father of certain things. One is the, the father of, of everybody who um, is a, a musician, an entertainer, and all that. He sort of fathered uh, th this sort of um, vocation. And the other one is, is, is uh, the father of all of them, who it, it says that they have makne, so they deal in live possessions, slaves, cattle, so on. And, and they try to say that it's like iron worker and brass workers, but it's not. It's people that deal in in money in commodities. Well, ba basically, that makes so much sense because so they're, what they're I the, when, go ahead. Oh yeah, sorry. It's just a, okay. a minor segue to the Tartarian point because mm -hmm. ethnologists in in that era again were saying that the line of Cain became you know the the Goths, the Celts, and the Tatars. So they're mm -hmm. saying that the Great Tartarian Empire traces themselves like really far back to to Cain, and the idea is that. Cain was the inventor of the arts because uh, mm -hmm. Abel was lazy, right? So Cain went out and actually did something and learned stuff and built stuff. So, mm -hmm. so that's really the connection to, to the Tatars being an industrious people by, by so, that um, relation, yes. Yeah, so I mean, if you have these, you've got these two sons and they're named as the fathers of all of these entertainers, the fathers of all of these people who deal in in human and animal uh, commodities, and then the people who deal in precious metal commodities. Now, if they're the fathers of those things and the flood comes and kills everybody, it really doesn't matter. That's moot point. One thing. The second thing is, post-flood, 
there is a people who actually lives among a number of the other peoples that are established in time. They're called the Kenites. That's how they're translated, but they're the Kenim. They're the Kenim. Now, there's no other Ken mentioned. And in fact, he would have had such a bad name for being the first murderer. I don't know how many people would have named their son Ken after that. But there are these Kenites that just appear out of nowhere who are now living amongst the various people and they're practicing the same sort of things that those two sons of tubal Cain were known to do. So, it, you know, that's just another thing that speaks against a worldwide flood. The other thing is giants. All right. Hmm. Yeah. The how did they survive? Is, they're still around after the flood. Yeah. So this, there were this giants idea. In the earth after yeah. The, the flood. Yeah. The idea that, that Genesis 6 is speaking of some spawning of giants and that that's why the flood came, well, then they still shouldn't be there after the flood. And and the people who subscribe to certain theories, they have to, they kind of have to do a lot of gymnastics to explain that. But that's the yeah. problem. We have things before the flood. We have things after the floods. So a worldwide flood just, it doesn't even, it's not even really supported biblically. So, I mean, that's the reason that I, I, I just don't buy it. Yeah. Not that we, um, like, uh, both the Greek philosophers and the Bible mentions, like, a, a continuance of resets on, on this plane of existence. So, I, I really find it interesting to, to really zoom in on these uh, cataclysms and um, because mm -hmm. the, the scope, the worldwide scope of the flood has been, you know, really uh, like like this blanket term for a lot of things we mm -hmm. see in in alternative geology. Then people see something like with with earth layers that are anomalous, and then they say, "Oh yeah, the worldwide flood." But mm -hmm. it, it it's too cheap, it's too easy, right? So mm -hmm. I never really chimed with that, um, and I and find it very interesting that you can support it biblically. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, that and you know the the word that's actually used. For this flood uh, in, in Genesis 7 and 8, um, I'm going to do this from memory, so I hope I don't mess this up. I, I believe uh, the word there is mabul, and it's not that different. Uh, is that M-B-L in ovary? M -M yeah, M-B-U-L, mabul, okay. and yeah. I'm going to just try to go to it real quick and, and talk through in case I don't find it. Um, but the thing is, it's actually a different word than later on in the Bible when you see floods being talked about. There's actually a few different words that are used to describe a type of flood. Um, you know, for instance, Mabul, it, it doesn't even point to something that um, is necessarily water, and neither does some of the other words that are translated as flood. One of the words that's sometimes translated as flood is um, um, Peleg, which uh, oh, Ober, yeah, the, um, where the, the language Pelek. comes from. Yeah, the language comes from Ober. He had one son named Peleg, which he named him that because in his days, uh, the, the, earth, the land was, it says actually the Eretz, the land was divided. That's another word that's translated as flood. There's about three, maybe four of them. And they don't necessarily mean water. You've got to find water with them. Mabul is probably one of the ones that you can find water with. Some of them you can't. Um, and you know, cataclysm is, is something we can talk about too, because um, lately, I think I did, I think I did one episode of the Bible in Obri where I talked about cataclysm and very likely cataclysm after the time of Christ. Uh, in the yeah, land, a, a, a later cataclysm, so to speak. Yeah, and and maybe within within the the century of, because look, I mean, even in the New Testament, the narrative is cut off within decades after the story of Christ. Mm -hmm. No more narrative. Indeed, um, the, they so, also have the the, the so called eighteen missing years, right? Or is it the twelve? Or no, eighteen missing years, isn't it? I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, what you're referring to. No, no. To. Okay, wait. He, um, yeah, uh, Jesus' ministry. 
from uh, from um, yeah up until 18 years the the year of his majority that was a lot he, yeah he he went missing wasn't it that uh, the 12 missing years isn't it um yeah ah, i'm butchering there's this. a lot of well there's theories that that he had traveled around that that he had visited cornwall england for instance i don't Indian, i don't know what there is Japan. to that what's that uh, if you look at uh, Exertus, uh, our friend, he has a um, a video about uh, Jesus being buried in Japan. There is a, a an, um, very interestingly in later geography, a, mm -hmm. an island very close to Japan was called um, uh, Isla de Yeso, I E S S O, like mm -hmm. uh, Yesa, right? Yeso. Okay. So in jo in Georgian, if you take Yeso. Uh, it, yeah. uh, you can go back through uh, the Georgian language and find the the direct link to Jesus Christ. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then on Tartarian maps of America, you see in Alaska, which would be in Arabic Al Aska, which means the furthest most west, which is interesting. Mm. Al Aska. Mm. Uh, it, there is a spot called Terra de Yeso, which would directly be translated as uh, Jesus's land. Mm. Which That's I, interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, so he gives in uh, is Matthew twenty four. It's a really famous chapter because it's it's a very cataclysmic chapter. It's very it's eschatological, and the language he uses is very cataclysmic in quite a lot of it. Now, if we go to to Revelation from there, and let's say we read it without applying uh, the sort of left behind futurism model. Or, or the the historic uh, the historicist model, we see a lot of cataclysm in that. We see earthquakes, floods, um, all kinds of what people would consider natural disasters. Now the thing is, in the Bible narrative, there were major prophets that were sent to the people, usually right before a very major event occurred an extremely major event mm -hmm. this would happen all the time there was um moses was sent to the people before uh the exodus from mitzrim and there were some major events that happened during that time there was uh elijah and elisha they're probably the, the the most major prophets known of as far as like miracles and things like that in their ministry they're sent not long before the whole northern kingdom is essentially destroyed and carried away by Asher or Assyria. Um, major prophets are sent before major things happen. Jeremiah and even Isaiah were sent right before Babel comes and takes away Judah. This is a pattern, and a very terrible thing happens. So now Jesus prophesies in Matthew 24 that there were going to be these really horrific things that happen. Now, if we were to read the account from Flavius Josephus, mm -hmm. based on the popular narrative, that <clears throat> uh, what happened was that Titus, uh, the Roman general, uh, came against the city of Jerusalem because of uh, this this uprising. There was a, a four year siege. Uh, there was some. There was hunger. There was starvation. Uh, there was intrigue from within, so on and so forth. And, and then they, they burned the temple, which I don't know how they managed to do that. Um, and well, then... well, they probably uh, used some, well, the, the line of research we are also engaged in is uh, actually uh, ancient weaponry, ancient technology. And uh, mm -hmm. a, a researcher called Martin Litke uh, pretty much says that what they did, the so-called Romans, was when they brought down um, the temple, that they did it with directed energy weapons. And uh, those being the the fascies, uh, you know mm. that uh, bundle of uh, ruts, so called, with an axe mm. on them. Well, mm -hmm. they have they have pretty much um, brought the idea forward that it was a handheld energy device based on uh, magnets that were stacked together. And they burned stone with that. Yeah. Or okay. they caused, uh, you know, um, like have you heard about the pooping the pooping noise? Like you, you emit a frequency and everybody starts pooping. <laughs> well, uh, imagine like as with the walls of Jericho, you used a a frequency weapon that was tuned to that stone that the temple was built with. Then you could theoretically uh, disintegrate it with sound through vibration. Yeah. Okay. All right. So 
the whole narrative from Josephus basically describes something that doesn't even seem to be as bad as the sieges that Nebuchadnezzar affected against Jerusalem when, when he took over, or, or even the there was one siege a couple of centuries before that from Aram, which is usually called Syria, uh, against uh, the northern kingdom's capital, which is Shomron, and it's usually called Samaria. They're they're mm. really not even not even that bad, okay? But but Jesus is describing something that he specifically says there was never a time of trouble like this from the beginning until now, nor would there ever be. That bad. That bad. So yeah. everything Josephus describes doesn't come close to holding a candle to what Jesus is describing. So one of the things I haven't really had time to explore but, this a whole lot. Don't don't you find it interesting though that the common um let's say iconography of the the New Testament and what Jesus is saying and, and like the land Jesus is walking in is completely the opposite of how the Ben Josephus describes um biblical uh, Judah or uh, Canaan or Jerusalem, it's like a war zone, according to Josephus. It's a wasteland, mm -hmm. barren war zone full of war, and the Jews are looking for mm -hmm. a warrior savior. And in the New Testament, Jesus is walking uh, peacefully among fishermen and, and yada, 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 right? It's, it's like two it's different, very different stories. It is very different. And the, the relationship that the, um, the, the Udeos which they are in Greek, they're called Wideus, and it's just a transliteration of Yuda from the, the Old Testament. So those people are getting along a lot better with uh, whoever their overlords are. They're called basically Roma in the New Testament, but that right there can be another blanket obery term for those who are elevated above you. There's factions within them, uh, one guy is called, he, he said, from the Italian regiment. Oh, like and I a can't caste recall the, system? Well, no, they, they're, they're some kind of a nation. But what I'm saying is, were they actually a nation of Rome? And was that Rome actually located in Italy? I'm not sure. Because no, there's factions of that army. There's factions of that army named. So, like, different nations. It sounds more like a federation of nations were ruling over them. As opposed right. to a monolith like Rome, that's like, all I'm so, saying. Yeah, interesting. Such a great, uh, such a great little detail that changes everything. It, it would sound like something that mm -hmm. um, is akin to Atlantis, like a trading union. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and here, yeah, here's something else with the um, let, let's just say with the geography, how different we'll say it was than what Josephus described. So obviously, Jesus had visited or ministered. To, for one thing, a city that's that's translated in the New Testament as Chorazan. Well, Chorazan is a city that would have been in the extreme south of the uh, the allotment of Judah, which would essentially put it in the Negev, in really horrific uh, territory. Um, and the fact that he would have basically been walking back and forth from there to where we think Jerusalem is, a little bit hard to buy. Even if if anybody's okay with desertification, um, it's How? just kind of a stretch that the that sort of travel um, between that extreme south and the other places that he was supposedly traveling, and it appears that he's doing all of his traveling with his disciples on foot. Right, it's like the same thing with the forty years of uh, in the wilderness. It's 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 basically the opposite story here where they're walking a very, very short distance and using 40 years to do so. Yeah, there's a lot of bad indiscrepancies with, uh, with distances. That's yeah. the other thing that I, I, I really hope I, I'm beginning to impress in my papers and some of the work that I do. There's nothing in the Bible that gives us any indication as to distance and mileage. It's so difficult. The only gauges that you get are things like days. And so in maybe one passage, it'll say that it's, it's 11 days journey from Mount Horeb, which is Mount, Mount Sinai, to, uh, to the border of uh, Mount Shoir or Sair, which would be Edom. 
Yeah, okay. but since you don't know uh, how fast you traveled or the means of transportation back in that day, how can exactly. you know how, how long you would travel during a day? Yeah. Well, exactly. Because we have a story later on where the prophet Elijah is uh, sort of running from, basically running from his troubles. He's kind of had enough. And he goes down to one of the southernmost cities, which is, uh, it's called Kadesh Barnea or Kadesh Berno. And from there, he leaves his servant. He has a manservant. He leaves him there and he travels to Mount Horeb. And it takes him 40 days. It says he was 40 days in the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb. You know, the, something springs into mind. Like, I know it's mainstream accepted, or at least accepted by a lot of biblical scholars, that these people who are biblical characters were a great deal taller than us. So, have anyone ever in theology considered that these people are taking much larger steps? I mean, if they were a lot taller than us, then that would really change. That would change travel times tremendously. Right. It would change scale tremendously, what they were, you know, uh, able to do. And, and then, you know, I mean, geez, we could go into technology as well. The idea of rakab, this word that occurs over and over and over, rakab, rakab. Um, a lot of things can be rakab. Rakab is this general word. And I have somebody who comes to my channel from time to time who speaks Arabic. And they even have that word in Arabic because Arabic is I hate to overextend myself here, but to me, this is just to me, Arabic seems to be an outcropping of what we experience in modern day Aramaic and Hebrew. Now, I know that the characters are different because they're more script and cursive, but their lexicography seems yeah. to be an outcropping, or at least they inherited a lot from it. That's well, you can even see um, you can even see um, typographical bridges between Arabic and Greece sometimes with Greek numbers. Even it's really mm -hmm. weird. Um, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And and this you know this Arabic uh, really nice fellow that comes from time to time. Uh, we talked a little bit about cab, and he told me the same thing. He says, "No, cab is just a a word we use for a." Basically, a means of transportation. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be in a car, on a horse, in a train, in a ship. It is a means of transportation. Now, that rakab, it occurs a lot. And one thing that I'm learning is that in Obery, instead of like with English and other Western languages, where we've got things broken down into nouns and verbs and then adjectives and adverbs, in Obri, it seems like the breakdown is a little bit more like what I was calling universal words, complete words, because a word could be, depending on its context and how it was used, an action or a noun or a descriptive. And what I found out is that these seem to be being built on this principle of attribute. Um, a noun, basically a thing, has attributes. And attributes kind of dictate verb, which is why you could see the same word being used as either a thing or an action, because it's literally its attributes or what it does that dictate what it is and vice versa. So with Rakab, um, it's essentially some sort of vehicle. It is used in a noun form. It is used in a verb form. So vehicle, and, that, that, that piques my interest. Because it, if it they had used mm -hmm. horse and buggy or anything, yeah. would they have used a very specific word? They may have. Um, in fact, there are a whole range of, of various words that are usually translated over and over in English as things like horse, donkey, um, chariot. Um, I'm going to give you a, a good example real quick, and I'm just going to type this in uh, and tell you what this this word here is. And this is a, a really strange thing. So it's marakab. It's just the same root with the uh, the M prefix, which tends to solidify something as a thing. Mm. What's really crazy is we see very early on, for instance, that uh, in in Joshua and in Judges, we see this a lot, 
that the people who inhabited the land when Israel came into it, a number of them had what they call um, Marakab Barzal, or Iron Chariots. Now, wow. I don't know how many people are really wow. <laughs> uh, keen on the, um, the logistics of warfare and the use of chariots. Chariots. Everything I, I've I, ever seen. Iron chariots? You serious? Now um, imagine, yeah, imagine that for a second. Because if you have, if you want to be effective based on the establishment's narrative, if you want to be effective as a charioteer, you're probably going to have two men in it and you've got one horse pulling it. As soon as you have more than one horse, then you've got to deal with the problem of a team and how they're going to react, and how they're going to react in a warfare situation. And you want that chariot to be relatively light. In fact, they said that most chariots, based on their model, were light, very lightweight, a lot of them wicker even. They're carrying a chariot and two men, because you would have to have one who was an archer, right? Yeah. So now you've got the horse towing an iron chariot. Well, first off, what difference does it make if chariots are the way that they say they are and you've got two men standing in them and, and basically from their waist up, they're exposed? I don't know what in the world Iron Chariots has to do with the fact that they couldn't clear these people out. Well, And that's exactly the reason the Bible gives. Judah couldn't clear out the Canaanites in the valley. Why? They had Iron Chariots. They had Merikab Barzal. Huh. Wow. So it's logically consistent. Wow, that it's that's very interesting because um, if I look at like um, old art from the Victorian era, you mm -hmm. will find something called iron chariots uh, in London or the vicinity, and those are steam-powered iron cars, the first of their kind. So, uh, well, allegedly. So I find yeah. that interesting. Could, could, could it really have been steam-powered? Iron chariots back then. Who Wouldn't knows? surprise me. Like, I mean, wow. steam is steam is such a good, effective technology. I, I love steam. Absolutely love steam. There's a steam museum just down the road from me, uh, and it's fantastic. And you know, and I would like to ask any of the listeners if they really believe that we existed for nearly six thousand years, according to. That's basically the Jewish timeline is 6,000 years. I don't think the Bible actually agrees with 6,000. But did we exist that long without at least steam technology? Do, does everybody really believe that? Do and, you think? Do you really think that someone can conceptualize an idea of God and not have common building skills and common technologies such as steam? Exactly. It seems, it seems a bit like, yeah, weird. But but uh, we have approximately 25 minutes left. I just wanted to remind our audience that you're listening to uh, Radio Tartary on Studio B from uh, Revolution Radio, and we are listener-supported. So please go into our website at um, freedomslips.com and find a way to don uh, donate. You can become a Patreon, and there is a, a PayPal as well, and there are other ways to do so. So without the listener, there would be no... Revolution Radio and no radio tauntery. So please, please um, find a way to donate and check out the website at freedomslips.com. Um, yeah, Jonathan, I really, um, I really wanted you to um, to take us through your discoveries about the Amorites and Amory and the relation to America, <clears throat> possibly. Sure. All right. So the the verse that uh, was really. Uh, bothering me for a long time. It was in Genesis 15, actually. And um, it was where Yahweh had promised uh, Abram. So that's the name a lot of people will hear me say that. They might be familiar with people saying Yahweh or Yahuwah or something like that. I pronounce his name Yahweh. It's uh, for me, I have a video on this and you'll have to sort through my videos a little bit to get to it. But I talk about his name and the, and the name of, of Jesus and why I pronounce them the way that I do. So when I say that, that's who I'm referring to. So he promises Abraham that uh, in 400 years, his descendants were going to, to come back and, and occupy the land. And what he said was, 
that the uh, the sin or the iniquity of the Amorite was not yet full. This is Genesis fifteen sixteen. What I couldn't understand about that is that he had just given a list of all of these different peoples that lived there, but he blankets them as these Amorites. And the reason I say Amory is because if you look at the source text, that's literally how you would say their name. It would be A-M-R-E, Amory. So that just bothered me for a while, and I, I didn't really think too much more into it until um, I started stumbling across other texts in in which certain groups, let's say the Hivites, the Hittites, were in one passage. Let's say they were called Hittites. For instance, Abraham has to buy uh, this burial ground near what we know of as Hebron from the Bible from these Hittites. But after uh, his descendants go down to Mitzram, the place is taken over by these giants called the Onakim or Anakim. But later on, they are referred to when referring back to the experiences with Abraham and these people, which were only either Hittites or later on these, uh, Amal- um, these Amalekites. They're referred to as Amory or Amorites. Um, again, when they, they come out of Mitzram uh, up to what people think is Transjordan, it's the other side of this Yarden, um, they deal with these two kings. Uh, one is Sihun, the other is Og. Og is a Repaim, which is a giant. However, even though he's clearly a Repaim and his land, Bashan, is called the land of Repaim, he is called an Amorite. Again, Sihun and his subjects are called Amorites, but his subjects, we clearly see, are Midianites and Moabites, but they're called Amory. Um, later on, when the Israelites uh, have sort of a, a final battle before they have this long period of peace with the Philistines, not the Palestinians, the Philistines, they're called Amorites in the text. Literally, it says that there was peace with the cities of the Philistines. There was peace with the Amorites. So over and over again, I cite 16 examples that I found, and I've actually found one or two cents, and I need to incorporate them when I publish. I am working on a book, and I was going to include that paper as a condensed chapter. I need to include a couple of these more, uh, these references that I found since then. 16 references where people who are clearly not Amorite tribally are called Amorites. There's another reference in Amos where uh, Yahweh says that when he brought Israel into the land, uh, there were these giants that they overcame. And he says that they were like these trees. They were so tall. And he says again, Amorites. Well, these Amorites, they came from the same stock as Ham, Shem, and Japheth. They, they have similar uh, lineage and genetics. They're never called giants. The Onakim are called giants. The Repaim are called giants. And we can see that contextually. But over and over again, the blanket term of Amory, 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 is put upon the people over and over and over again. This even occurs in, in later books like uh, Nehemiah, again, a blanket term of Amorite. And, and Israel hadn't even dealt with Amorites for many, many centuries, tribal Amorites. And people of the land, no matter what they were tribally, are continually called Amory, Amory. So much so that one would think that if that had become a blanket term for people and lands or land of, that perhaps it stuck. And, you know, I don't know, maybe whether the people that have been running things for a long time, whether it was to their will or not, that term stuck. And, and the thing is, you know, you have other terms. Another blanket term, and it's not as ubiquitous as Amory, is uh, Canon, um, the Canaanites. Right. And I did think that it was very strange. Uh, anybody can take what they want to from this, that 
They and, don't really have a solid story concerning the origin of the words Canada and America, or even Mexico. Look into it, and yeah, and yeah, I, you guys I, believe it. I, I know this, I, and I find, I think personally, just quickly, that uh, Mexico is from Meshek, uh, one of the sons of uh, Japhet, and I think mm -hmm. America. May may actually be your Amory. I think it's very promising, and I think Canada may be from Cain or Ab Canaan, uh, the Phoenicians, mm -hmm. right? The Phoenicians never called themselves Phoenicians; they called themselves Ab Canun or Ab Canaan. Mm. And that you know, that's the other thing: the idea of mixing Phoenician with the biblical Tzidon and Tzur. I mean, there's nothing biblically that that links them. Um, So that, oh, that's yeah, another they, example of didn't history. Didn't they go to Sidon, um, the Phoenicians? Didn't they travel there? The only thing they did, to trade it with Sidon or something like I that? Don't, I don't know. Like, biblically, I don't know because there's no mention of these people, the Phoenicians, in the Bible. What I'm saying is there, there's that, that marrying again of a history that, I, I, I mean, it may have happened. I, I can't say whether it did or not. But all I'm saying is that I don't have it in the Bible. Okay. I have uh, I have a huge nation called Greater Tzidon, and then I have this major trading city. It's a major city called Tzur. Almost everything in this land goes through this city. And again, there's no mention of Phoenicia. That's it's kind of that thing like with Alexander of Macedon and Iyun. Um, it's kind of like that thing of Paris and Persia. Um, or, or yeah, that you cannot find France on on pre 1700s maps nearly because you have Gallia, or or Russia is non-existent on the old maps because you have um, Mo Moscovia mm -hmm. or Tartary instead. It's it's kind of like the same yeah. deal. Yeah, and I know, but, but, but you know, how I know. You, go ahead. Um, yeah, sorry. How do you uh, relate uh, the Amorites and uh, Amory to America? Like, how how did you uh, arrive at that um, that point? Well, I mean, there's the phonetics. Um, indeed, indeed. Which, which are the most obvious part. The other thing is, 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 as I said, I think earlier on, is that culturally, there's just not the kind of harmony uh, once you start peeling away the layers in the Bible with the popular establishment history that links these stories to the Levant Egypt and Mesopotamia. I saw yeah. a very different culture. Um, I saw a culture where they're burning down cities with fire. And you can't burn down cities made from mud brick or stone and rock with fire. You'll have combustibles in the houses, that's true. Um, I mean, if you want to believe they had hay roofs, or, more power to you. Or unless, like, the fire is like the Greeks. Uh, idea of fire, which would be much more akin to electricity, actually, or plasma. Um, I mean, they they had they had like the word the old word for amber, which mm -hmm. uh, would be very close to also the word for phoenix. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, yeah. So so there's this idea about uh, holy fire. Is it's not mm -hmm. only like fire as you would have around um, mm -hmm. burning wood, but but yeah. some sort of special godly kind of mm -hmm. fire. L. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, and then, you know, if we want to go forward a little bit too, for instance, the house that Solomon builds to to put the ark in uh, and to do the rituals that were done in the tabernacle in the wilderness, he it's often referred to as the house of the Lebanon. And Nathan and I discussed this idea of Laban and Lebane as a wood. It's called the house of the Lebanon, not a stone house. Um, further. More, for instance, in Nehemiah 2.8, this is a guy who was an official for this uh, this Parisian or Paris empire. He comes back, <clears throat> he asks the king if he wouldn't mind sending a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple, for the wall of the city, and for the house that I will occupy. They built a whole lot with wood. They pulled a whole lot out of very major forests, and 
that's one thing that just doesn't harmonize with what we see in a Levin, uh, Levantine model. So they are carpenters <coughs> and lumberjacks. It would appear so. Well, that chimes a lot with uh, a guy named Weisub in our community. He's been looking at old uh, structures, old temples, especially in Egypt, and he says that a lot of these things <laughs> actually look like they have been not carved in stone, but carved in wood, and then later mineralized, turning into stone. Mm. Um, so, so that chimes really well with, um, with what you're saying there, because a lot mm -hmm. of perhaps the things that we see in America that have that are in stone, like old stone foundation, could they have possibly been wood ones? And could mm -hmm. they have been petrified? Um, mm -hmm. so, so that's an open question, of course. But, right. but, uh, but yeah, Jonathan, um, how, how does, um, yeah, uh, again, the Amorites figure into um, uh, the geography? You told me that we cannot support the, uh, the Palestinian or the, the Mesopotamian model of where it all happened. So we have to look another place. That's like the, the first point, right? So so where what led you down that direction to the the furthermost west? All right. Well one thing is this <clears throat> there's a number of prophecies that say that the land would sit desolate for a very long time. The people were going to, to go away and it was going to be very much uh, a wilderness. All right, so so really no civilization to speak of for quite a long time. Um, Palestine, for according to all the records we have, has existed, did exist until about 1948 at a pretty much a steady state. Um, there was always these basic civilizations, these cities and towns. Uh, people came and went from there. I mean, it was very common. There was never a desolation. There was never a wilderness, per se. Um, so that's one thing that this land would sit pretty much idle as a wilderness for a very long time. Um, another thing would be just the logistics of being able to feed people, um, and water people. And this is something I go into a little bit in my paper, the patriarchs, their livestock and the land. Um, however, since then, you know, I've made a lot more discoveries concerning water and, the the sorts of um, really cutting edge technology, for instance, that um, the Jews have had to use over in Palestine and Transjordan uh, to even uh, deliver the the appropriate water needs to about six to eight million people. And when you consider that, when when Israel is going to go into the Promised Land, they have to be two to three million strong, because the numbering is based on the men who are 20 and up and can go to war. So you, you extrapolate that from your basic population demographics, and you know they got to be <clears throat> two to three million strong. Now, Yahweh says that they're going to go in, there's going to be seven nations that they're going to be confronting that are both greater and more powerful than them. So now we've got at least 21 million people, and that's not counting the Philistines, that's not counting the Sidonians, that's not counting the Aramis, that's not counting those on the other side of the Arden, it's not counting the Edomites, the Amalekites, the Oribim, none of them. That's just counting the sons of Canaan, 21 hmm. million. So, so there is a logistical problem, of course. Yeah. What, right. So, so like a, a place that could have harbored such a multitude would have been Asia or America. I would think. And I would it, think it, it just and, has and to be a big place. And it also ties in with the biblical description of the Holy Land, describing tall mountains, tar pits and uh, large forests and right. that's the other thing yeah people have to understand that too about palestine and transjordan there aren't really mountains there because the no Dead so, sea, so how can the temple mount be there if the temple mount is on a tall mountain how can the temple mount be there and it was on a mountain yeah it's on yeah. this mount it's on a, a very specific mount called mura or or murray 
Morea, and it's it's not like what we see over in the Jerusalem of today. It, 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 it was uh, <coughs> Mount Meru. What became Mount Meru, at least nominally? I don't know. I, don't I know. think so, at least, because I've heard that. Um, well, yeah, I, I sometimes I assert myself. <laughs> I'm a bit mm -hmm. assertive. But it's just because my, my memory jogs on and I remember a scholar saying that. Well, that's a, yeah, that's okay. I mean, that's, that's where we tend to get somewhere with ideas. I'm just saying whether I know something or not, I'm usually going to be as honest as I can say. I don't know. <laughs> it could be. Yeah, um, yeah it could. But, yeah, Nathan but that's told the thing. That. Palestine and, and Transjordan, there, there, are, there were so many misleading books written and printed in the 1800s about this place that I think really, really supported the efforts of the Royal Society over there and this push for this, this Palestinian homeland uh, for the Jews. And they're describing this place like it's the Bible, but they're being very deceptive about it because the thing is, there's not mountains to speak of. There's hills. It's rocky. It's gravelly. That's true. And the landscape is pretty broken. That's true as well. There are some big canyons there. That's also true. But you have to consider the fact that the Dead Sea and the whole rift from the Dead Sea up to uh, what they call the Sea of Galilee, um, that with its apogee at the Dead Sea, that's the furthest down under sea level that any piece of land that we know of on Earth goes. Mm. So the actual sea level of most of the land around there, it's not that high. It doesn't really qualify as mountain high. None of it does. So did that's you, the first did thing. You, you know? Did you know that um, that uh, the Nahuatl uh, language, it has a very interesting... Um, there is a place for some uh, American Indian tribes. It's called uh, uh, Chichimeca. And mm -hmm. in their language, it means uh, the, the land of milk. And right next to it, right west of it, you have uh, the Californian Bay. And on mm -hmm. old maps, that was referred to as the Sea of Vermilion. And as you mm. know, Vermilion yeah. is red. Red, yeah. Yeah, so well, the Red okay. Sea next to the land of honey. All that's based the, on, oh, the land of milk, sorry, all based on Native American lore. That's another thing, is that I wanted to get to that too. There's plenty of evidence in America. Oh, you have two minutes, Jonathan, it, sir. It, it was multiracial. There is evidence that there were Caucasians dwelling here. We obviously know that there are these Indian peoples, which as you go far enough back in records, they weren't homogenous. There were a lot of different kinds of people here too. So we have evidence that a lot of different kinds of people once lived here. Um, I would yeah. just recommend that people definitely start looking around and don't look at the Bible as some kind of a dead book. Look at their, their narrative their theories as dead, it's, there's a wealth of information in it, um, you know, for anybody who, who wants to really, you know, dig in, but it's not, it's not easy, but it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone, please check out, uh, your channel, Jonathan McFeems on YouTube. And mm -hmm. he does the Opry project, O B R Y in capital letters and project with a K, right? Correct. And they, could, you know, my website is Obery Project with a K dot info, and you can kind of get all the information on, you know, the various channels. And I try to post documents whenever I can there. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. This has been excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, all new yeah, information for many people, I'm sure. And uh, I, I think, uh, Jonathan, that uh, when we tie all your information into to historical revisionism, and I know you, you, you already doing that. Uh, it, it, it has a lot of things that really turns things on their heads. Um, so I would say kudos and, and keep doing what you're doing because um, I have gained a multitude of new great ideas and, and I gained a new appreciation uh, for the Bible. That there is this, this language where when you interpret it in the old proto-Hebrew language, you gain a more nuanced, detailed, more logical, consistent sense of biblical history, and I really thank you for that because that mm -hmm. has opened um, a door that has been shut for me. So, uh, yeah, oh, I'm glad thank to hear you that. A lot. I'm glad to hear that. Then, then what I've done has been effective. So, very happy to hear that, and thank you for having me on. This has been uh, a real pleasure. 
Well, yeah, I hope to have you on on another time soon because uh, you you can't really uh, get around uh, even ten percent of what you have to say in uh, a matter of two hours. So yeah, it's <laughs> difficult, huh? Yeah, yeah. but I, I know I know you have um, things to see too. So so maybe we can reconvene in in a couple of months. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, let me know. Awesome, man. Well, uh, well, yeah. Then uh, there's nothing else to say than uh, than thank you for tuning in this Saturday to uh, to Radio Tartary on Studio B Revolution Radio. I thank you for listening. And uh, today's guest, Jonathan Macthemes from the Opry Project, has been a real pleasure. And uh, I hope that uh, we will see you again soon. So thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, Victor. Bye. Bye bye.